I didn't really get properly into Bitcoin then. I was just buying and selling yeah, just so I could go on uh, the Silk Road and just buy drugs. Um, and that obviously came crashing down. I became an ad, uh, you know, I got an addiction and, you know, that's years ago now. But I came back into Bitcoin back in 2017 because my mum was sick and we wanted to get her treatment. And I just said to my dad, look, um, uh, I used to do a lot of drugs. I used to buy them online and we can get a treatment for mum. We wanted to get her cannabis oil. I was like, the similar websites, we can do it. So that's how I got back into it. It's like, it came full circle. Thank you for coming on, Peter. It's a pleasure having you, man. Welcome, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, a lot of my, uh, a lot of our followers have heard about Bitcoin, obviously, but they don't really know how it works. Would you mind giving us a quick explanation, the simplest way possible, of what Bitcoin is? Ha! Huh. That's a funny thing. It's a funny question because I've been studying it now for four years, and, and I still find it complicated. The simplest explanation I can give to your listeners is that Bitcoin is like a digital version of gold. So if you're an older listener and you remember buying records or CDs, and then one day you didn't, you just listened to MP3s and you no longer needed your record collection. Well, Bitcoin is like that for gold, okay? But not because of what people think gold is used for. Like gold is used a lot for jewelry, jewelry and manufacturing. But actually, one of its primary use cases is what's known as a store of value. So whilst they you know, create jewelry out of it, whilst it's used in manufacturing and industrial use, actually, governments tend to store a huge amount of gold in their vaults. And the reason they do that is it tends to hold value really well. So currencies fluctuate. You know, they, you know, and, and, and you can have any kind of disastrous scenario for a, for a currency, but gold tends to always be pretty stable. And the reason it tends to be stable is because it's just a very rare metal. It's it's very scarce and it's hard, you know, it's hard to mine gold. So where where MP3 is digitized records, um, Bitcoin digitizes gold. It creates a form of money which is limited. So, I mean, I can't remember how much gold there is on Earth, but with Bitcoin, there will only ever be 21 million. So the idea being is that if you are in a, you know, want to avoid the the risks of inflation, so for example, you know, Venezuela is a great example. <laughs> um, Zimbabwe, even Turkey right now. If you want to avoid inflation, you want to hold money long term. A lot of people th consider Bitcoin a good option because hmm. you, there's only ever going to be 21 million, so it's scarce. Whereas the money is, you know. The money the government has, they print as much as they want. I mean, Maduro does it. Um, that's why you had massive inflation for years, starting under Chavez. You know, when the when the oil price started to drop, and to fund his uh, social programs, I think it was like a third of the people were employed by the government as well. They had to start printing money, and that causes inflation. Similar to Zimbabwe, it's going to happen across the rest of the world. But the other th cool thing about Bitcoin is that where you know the properties it has that makes it better than gold is money. The thing about gold as money is like if I wanted to send you $50 of gold and I've got my gold bar here, I have to try and chip off $50, you know, and you're over in Madrid and somehow I've got to post that to you. <laughs> but the cool thing about Bitcoin is I don't have to chip it off. Like I, I can just select $50 of Bitcoin, which would be like 0 0.00034, whatever. And then I can send that to you and, you know, within an hour that will be with you. Like within an hour that will be confirmed as with you. I mean, it will show up in your wallet immediately. So really, Bitcoin is the best form of money that's ever existed. And if, if any of your listeners are thinking, okay, that's a lot to take in, I would recommend there's a really good article. It's called The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. It's written by my friend Vijay Boyaparty. And he basically talks about the three main forms of money, Bitcoin, gold, and like what we call fiat currency, which is like pounds, euros, dollars. And he just compares them all and what makes them good money and what makes them bad money. And uh, that for me was a very helpful exercise in about learning what Bitcoin is. No, it's a great, a great explanation. And I think about it the same way. And you talk about it being limited about the technology use cases. But one very important part is also the amount of people that are getting behind Bitcoin. Would you say that part is the most important 
because we know there are other cryptocurrencies that claim to be faster and their technology more efficient or whatever. But how important is a part of people starting to adopt this um, crypto? Well, you're talking about the importance of network effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The internet had it. Uh, yeah, lots of different things have network effects. Mobile phones had network effects. Uh, yeah. Bitcoin, in some ways, is the most elegant form of cryptocurrency. Others would argue, oh, well, no, we've got a more elegant version here because it does A, B, C, D. It does it faster or cheaper or whatever. Yeah. Usually with some trade off. But the reality, even if Bitcoin isn't perfect, um, you know, even with its flaws or its, its critics, what it has is network effects. It has the network effect. You know, it was the first. It is the most trusted. It is the most decentralized. Um, and if somebody could invent a better Bitcoin, if someone could look at Bitcoin and go, I could rewrite this and I'll rewrite it this way and write it better. And maybe they would produce something better, but it still would lose to Bitcoin because they don't have the network effect. Um, and that's really super important. Well, when did you initially get interested in Bitcoin? How did it come into your life? That's a funny story. So, uh, so back in 2013, I think you know this. Do you know this story? Is yeah, I know about it. I know yeah, about you it. Know, you know. <laughs> yeah, so my, one of my friends just called me up and he was like, uh, yeah, I, I worked in advertising at the time. He's like, Pete, I know this website. I've heard about this website where you can buy drugs online. I was like, what, mate? He's like, yeah. No, there's this website. It's like uh, it's like Amazon. You can, like, they've got all the drugs you want. And uh, and there were all the people selling a review, so they won't sell you bad stuff because they don't want to get a bad review. And I'm like, what are you on about? <laughs> so anyway, he comes over, he shows me this. And I was like, this is wild. How does this, how is this even possible? And he said, well, look, the website's on the dark web. And you have to pay with this thing called Bitcoin, which is anonymous on online money. Turns out it's not anon anonymous, it's pseudo-anonymous, which is a slight difference. But anyway, so I was like, great, how do I get some Bitcoins? And it was local Bitcoin. So I went on mm. local Bitcoins and I bought some Bitcoin. And, you know, uh, I think the f and I, I bought some cocaine <laughs> back <laughs> in my old days of doing drugs. And it was probably like, I don't know, like two Bitcoin at the, no, no, it would have been about, about one Bitcoin at the time. So about. $50,000 now, about one Bitcoin, uh, $50 back then. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I didn't really get probably into Bitcoin then. I was just buying and selling yeah, just so I could go on uh, the Silk Road and just buy drugs. Um, and that obviously came crashing down. I became an ad, uh, you know, I got an addiction and, you know, that's years ago now. But I came back into Bitcoin back in 2017 because my mum was sick and we wanted to get her treatment. And, I just said to my dad, look, um, uh, I used to do a lot of drugs. I used to buy them online and we can get a treatment for mum. We wanted to get her cannabis oil. I was like, the similar websites, we can do it. So that's how I got back into it. It's like it came full circle. Yeah. At that point in your life, you're undergoing uh, a very traumatic experience. Your your mom had cancer. You, I don't know if it's around the same time that you got divorced and that you had this sort of... Uh, drug problem how, how did you cope with all of these life stresses that you had at the time yeah so the order is slightly different so the what what happened i mean i used to do drugs like occasionally casually uh but then i got divorced and it was a really traumatic divorce it was about as bad as you can get my you know my wife was having an affair when i got married with my best friend and i found out three months into the marriage um that had been happening all year and and that was it, you know, 12 years of, of a relationship and two kids and you realize she's you know, having an affair with someone who was in the room at the wedding. So that was it. Damn. The marriage was over and it was traumatic. It was, I mean, I, I guess I went into shock first and just got on with life and then, you know, she moved out um, and it hit me really badly and I stopped going to work. Uh, I had a successful advertising agency, but I just stopped going to work. I just didn't have an interest and I was drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs and I... Yeah, I eventually crashed. Um, but that was bef before the crash came before my mum got sick. Uh, the, the crash was pretty bad. I mean, I mean, there's one part of the story I've never told publicly. I still haven't just because there's too much shame involved with it. But I basically one day was just doing drugs all day, like all day. I'd ordered something from this website and it turned up in the morning. And I was like, kids had gone to school. And I was like, God, oh, 
just try a little bit did a little bit and then just you know 10 hours later i'm still doing it and then i had what i th- what i thought was a heart attack uh it turns out it was something called an svt um but basically my heart just went <laughs> like um it was, and it was like the worst panic attack uh I, I assumed i was having a heart attack um phone an ambulance ambulance came out uh was taken away into the hospital and yeah they said no you had something called an svt which is basically the electrical pulses within your heart um of just triggering too too much and had a long chat with the doctor and he told me off uh, and did cocaine once more after that and never did it again that was six six and a half years ago wow uh, and then mum got sick yeah and you didn't have any withdrawals is there something that you did specifically or you just got scared away from from the drugs i i had very bad anxiety and panic attacks and crippling anxiety uh, and what wasn't all the time but when it would hit you it just wouldn't go like you i could wake up with it or in the middle of the day it would hit me and then just all day it just like sat on me and i couldn't focus i couldn't work just this horrible fear inside of me um and you know i recognize now that was like depression as well um i you know was struggling with the breakup of my marriage and coming off the drugs and so uh i wanted i actually wanted to keep doing drugs my problem was the next time i did it i was getting anxious before doing it and then i had a panic attack as soon as i did it so i just couldn't do it it's just my i couldn't cope so what i ended up doing i went to the doctors and i was like listen i'm struggling here this isn't good um and he just wrote me a prescription for antidepressants and i got my car and i just like had this moment where i was like fucking hell like a year ago, I had a you know, successful advertising agency in London. I was about to get married to the woman I love. I've got two beautiful kids. I've got a nice new, you know, nice house, not a new house, nice house. Going to go on a honeymoon. And then it's a year later. My marriage is broken up. My kids aren't there. I'm a drug addict. Um, my company's collapsing. I guess like in a year, I was like, this is shit. And now I'm going to go on antidepressants. So I was like, fuck this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going on antidepressants. So I just whipped out my phone and I went on Google and I was like, what, what's the alternative? Like, what can you do instead? And three, there were like three things, meditate, run and yoga. So I went straight down to the local um, fitness store. I bought a pair of trainers, uh, put them on and I ran that day. And I pretty much ran every day for a year. There may, may have been like 10 15 20 days but almost like i would religiously get up and run and i would run five and then 10k and then half marathons and then i'd go to the gym and whatever class was available i didn't i think even it was like pilates at 11 o'clock with a bunch of old ladies i would go and do it (laughs) and i just kept doing that i went vegan um because mum got sick as i told you about mum got sick so she went vegan so i went vegan with her um and uh and then whenever the panic attacks came I would just meditate and I meditated them away. And I would say within about two years, it took me about two years and it was all gone. And I was, I was over it. And you still meditate, you still run, you still do all those things? Not as much. Uh, I do some meditation uh, when I need it and I should do more. Um, I do a little bit of the Wim Hof breathing. Um, <laughs> I'm not running at the moment for my back. I've put all the weight back on. Uh, because of my back, I've put my back out, so I just can't run. But I still weight train. I still psych, cycle. Um, and I still do yoga. Um, I'm not a vegan anymore. Um, uh, it's funny. I'm saying all this now, looking back and going, God, I was so healthy. I was thin. I was fast. I was... And now, <laughs> but like it was all a tool to get over like what was a combination of a drug addiction and like very bad depression. And you found Bitcoin for the second time coming out of this during this. When was this period? Well, so yeah, so I bought the so I had to get back into Bitcoin because I had to get some to buy the treatment for my mother. And then what happened was, she, um, she sadly she died, and I was in Ireland. Because she, she, my parents moved over there. My dad's from Ireland, and after she died, I was just sat in the house and I had this little bit of Bitcoin left over. And I went back on the Coinbase website um, to sell it, 
And then there was this other thing called Ethereum. And I was like, well, what's that? So I was looking <laughs> at that and looking at the Bitcoin. And I had nothing to do. So I just spent a couple of days reading reading about it properly this time. And I had some money left over from my company when that folded. Um, so I was like, I'm going to put some in. I said to my dad, um, I'm going to put, you know, 30 grand in and I did and you know bought a bunch of bitcoin and and uh yeah like haven't looked back and here we are yeah pretty much four 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 years and two months later and you did this in the beginning of uh well not the first bull run but the first like really known bull run and I know I've read I wish, yeah uh, I would say that I'd say I would say there's been three ball runs. There's th- thirteen was interesting. Mm-hmm. Seventeen was massive. This one's insane. Yeah, for sure. So you started to get into it in uh, the second ball run, right? Ye- yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, now, now that we're in another ball run, I know that you mentioned that you committed some mistakes because you were just getting into the space. You might have bought some shit coins. Now that we are like almost at all time high and we don't know how high we can go, what do you recommend to people from your previous experience in the in the last bull run? Keep it simple. Um, you know, you might be tempted to go and trade these things, but these things are crazy. They go up and down like crazy, but most people lose money. Most people lose money. Very few actually make money. Um, so that's a tricky component. Um, if you can trade this, can you trade the stock market? I mean, the stock market's easier. If you can't trade the stock market, you're not going to be able to trade this. You might get lucky. Um, you can lose a lot of money as well. So I would say don't don't go and be a trader. It's really hard. Go and be a saver. like a, a, um, and, and consider Bitcoin a savings technology. Yeah, you know, a really good savings technology that rewards patience. Like everybody who's been in Bitcoin for four years has done well. It doesn't matter when they start. If you do four years, you do a whole cycle. You you, you do well out of it because of the monetary policy. It's designed in a way that supports this. So I would say focus on Bitcoin. Ignore all the shit coins. Ignore the temptation of shit coins. Just focus on Bitcoin. Keep stacking. Get a little bit each month. Do it for like, have like a 10 year time horizon and just keep learning about Bitcoin. Forget all the shit coins. No, I had, I had a very similar experience to you. I, at the time I was still in high school. I learned about Bitcoin. I started, you know, investing everything I had in Bitcoin. It went very well. And then I started, you know, to diversify. Everybody tells you to diversify. And at one point I was like at 200,000 worth of uh, shit coins. And um, I told my friend, I'm like, dude, these coins are way too high. Like, we need to do something. And his dad actually ran a crypto hedge fund at the time. They invested in ICOs. And he's like, no, bro, this is going to keep on going. I'm like, all right, this guy definitely knows more than me. Like, his dad works in the space. So I decided not to sell. And it went basically to zero. I don't remember what, but it went basically to zero. And what I learned was that everything... I, I don't like to say everything because I'm sure there's some like Ethereum might be great and another one might be great, but the vast majority is shit and Bitcoin is the only one that's been there this whole time. It's the only one that matters. Um, the problem with these other ones is you buy them like this Cardano stuff at the moment. You buy them and then you convince yourself they have meaning or they have use, but most people talking about it really don't understand what gives Bitcoin value, you know. Um, so I would just say, keep it simple, focus on Bitcoin, keep learning about Bitcoin, be patient, just be patient and just keep stacking by a little bit more, a little bit more. You're not too late. You know, we're talking about the best money that ever exists. It's sucking, it's sucking money in like gravity. Just be patient. So, so what's your opinion on like DeFi and non-fungible tokens? No interest in either of them. I think DeFi is just nonsense. It's, it's. I mean, it's, it looks like fun if you want to go in and but it's like a casino, dude. Like it's a bunch of people just playing a casino. Um, and then NFTs, I just think they're a novelty, and eventually that novelty will wear off, and people who bought them will lose money. 
So what do you think is the main people? So many people has have rallied behind Bitcoin and this culture of HODL has emerged and it's been such a long time now. Well, I think what it is, is that it, like I said to you, has that network effect. Um, and it also has a very smart group of thinkers, like philosophical thinkers who think around Bitcoin. Um, and hodling is really kind of like, it's like a, it's like part of your journey in Bitcoin that you've got to go, because it's so easy to get, you know, panic sell and panic buy because of FOMO. Um, but what you learn over time, if you really put the time into Bitcoin is you just learn to patience, dude. So learn to be patient and uh, you learn to hodl. You know, you see a 30% drop, meh, that's, that's fine. We'll carry on. And it, re- it tends to reward it over the longer term. Um, so I just think the thing about Bitcoin is it's like, it's, it's already, it's already achieved most of what it's trying to do, which is create money, which you cannot switch off, that can't be controlled by anyone. That's pretty much happening now. Yeah, you know, there's some a certain bits around the edges that you could argue against, but it's pretty much done that. And it was a million, sorry, a trillion dollar market cap recently, which is like mind blowing. So, uh, I think it has net. I think network effects are largely to do with us, but I also think it's the the, the attitude of a lot of Bitcoiners, the way they educate and support people and help them understand why Bitcoin is so important. Because we are talking about you know, societal changing money here. Like, this is like a revolution in money. It's the kind of thing where, and I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but but you could see a scenario in like 50 years, kids are taught about, or 100 years, they're taught about the transition from the fiat money world to the Bitcoin world. Like, this is what happened. This is how. Like, I can see that now. Um, and that's really important. So how would this world look like? Gosh, I think it's a. I, th- I think you learn other lessons from Bitcoin because you know, one of the things is always like, shall I sell a bit? But it might go up, so I don't want to sell it. So you you get some like financial discipline with it. Then I I think that just teaches you other areas of discipline in your life, maybe with your diet and your health and your exercise and your you know the choice of things you're going to spend your money on. So. I think production changes. I think we we shape a different world where maybe not everything is like, you know, everything is so commercialized. But I don't know, honestly. I'm just, I'd be guessing, dude. So I I personally think that banks are on their last couple of uh, of decades. What where do you see? Do you see a place in, uh, for banks in this uh, decentralized economy, or or do you think they're gone as well? Yeah, I'm with you on banks. I mean, I just had my bank account closed down by my bank. They gave me like 65. I've been with them for 25 years, dude. And they gave me 65 days notice and they said, we can't service you anymore. And I was like, why? And they said, we can't tell you. I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm a Bitcoiner and I lost my bank accounts. Right? They, they don't like this stuff. But I think they're block. I think most high street banks are looking very much like Blockbuster did, you know, back when, um, back when like Love Film and you know, Netflix first came out, but Blockbuster didn't see it coming and they destroyed their business. Blockbuster should have been Netflix, but they didn't see it coming. And I think it's the same for the banks. I think they're going to lose out to these neo banks. And you know, I've, I've got an app based bank on my phone now rather than, you know, my branch based bank. I think they're screwed. Um, I think they only get to make money off exploiting people with overdrafts and, you know, um, yeah, with overdrafts and, and loans, money they essentially print anyway. Um, so I, I'm with you. I think they're done. Yeah, for, for sure. And I've seen you started to to deviate from solely Bitcoin and you're focusing on new projects now. Well, why did you decide to make this transition? So I love doing the Bitcoin show. Like I really enjoy it. It's great. But I want to talk about other things. I've got nothing to do with Bitcoin. I want to interview other people. I want to research other topics. So I just launched another podcast, something where I could like creatively do something a bit different. So how hard, now, now that we're both in this space, podcasting is something that takes a lot of discipline and really a lot of uh, patience. 
How hard was it mm -hmm. for you to grow the f your first podcast, What Bitcoin Did Podcast? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I haven't found I haven't found it too hard, but I think it's mainly because I work hard. Like I really work hard. So, yeah, you know, when I first launched a podcast, I used to fly out to like America for three weeks, go and record 50 interviews and then come back for like six weeks and go back again. Uh, and I would spend nights in hotels and then get on another shitty plane and go from one shit town to another shit town. Like I really worked hard uh, to get the best interviews and to like craft my star and make my website as good. So I guess I didn't find it too hard. It, it's just been this like natural growth. I also think I was lucky. Like, I launched a Bitcoin podcast at just the right time. Like, if you launch one now, what a pain. There's so many out there already. Yeah? Like, how do you make a dent? Um, so, yeah, I yeah, I think I've been a little bit, I think it's a combination of luck of the timing and hard work um, that is the reason my show's done pretty well. Great. And what, lastly, what's one learning that really stuck with you from all the interviews that you've done? Oh, one thing that stuck with me from all the interviews I did. It's a really good question. Because I've done a lot. Hmm. It's a really tough one to answer because it's kind of like, I can tell you which interviews really stuck with me. Like, I did an interview with Lynn Albrook, the lady whose mother created the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Um which is such a weird chain of events, right? <laughs> like 2013, my buddy's like, you need to check this website out where you can buy drugs. It's called the Silk Road. And then I end up an addict using that website. I also discover Bitcoin. And then four years later, I'm in Austin, Texas, on her birthday, <laughs> no, on Russ Albrecht's birthday, interviewing his mum, who I've got to know very well. Um, that interview really stuck with me. That stuck with me a lot because I don't believe he should be in jail. Um, I don't believe, believe a man who's you know, trying to create something which is for liberty and freedom of choice should spend the rest of their life in jail for creating a website. And I know some people say, well, yeah, people you know, went on there and took drugs and died. Well, people take drugs every day and die. People you know, go to hospital and they get drugs for treatments and they die. And people walk in front of cars. If somebody wants to put drugs in their body, allow them their fucking body um but she she's really impacted me as a human as well like i've interviewed her four times but she's always traveling the world going to events trying to promote the release of her son but also she's got like this wider wider goal of improving the justice system and it's you know she's like 78 years old or something i hope hopefully i haven't said it too maybe she's younger but it's like She's really impacted me rather than a specific thing in an interview. I mean, my interviews aren't always profound. Most of them are just about Bitcoin. Um, but her, that was about someone's actual life. And we still don't know exactly how they found out it was him, right? Um, we still don't know if it definitely was him. Hmm. We that know he created it. We don't know if ongoing it was him. Um, I think we do. I think, I think he made a sloppy mistake early on and left like a trail of messages or something on the on the internet somewhere. But I don't know the full truth of that. No, th thank you, Peter. I think I've learned a lot, and I've personally a Bitcoin maximalist myself. It's great to talk to another much more experienced one, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a wild ride. But as you say, if you have patience and if you stick with it, in the long run, it's proven to to work. Yeah, man. Well, listen, great to have you on board. Love to have another Maxi around here. And if I get out to Madrid, perhaps uh, perhaps we can go and grab a beer together or something. <laughs>